you very much. That was great. Was if uh, Welcome very much to uh, Sunshine Baptist Church. If you guys, does anyone want to stand up? Should we stand up? Should we jump up? I feel like I feel like there's a lot of people sick and there's a lot of like tiredness today. So maybe we could just work on this. We're gonna like start down really low and then just jump up. Okay? Can we do that? Will that be too many injuries? We probably shouldn't do that. All right. How about we just stand nice and gentle, and uh, we'll stand up and uh, we'll sing together, worshiping the Lord. Pause really quick on this one. Does uh, who who knows the hand gestures? I feel like Marcus would know this. You don't know? That? I don't believe you. I actually don't believe you. Um, who said he does? Brian, do you know the hand gestures on this? No. Okay, good. Uh, I know uh, you do. Can you just help him out? You don't even have to be on camera. What? What? Oh my goodness! Everyone's so scared. All right, if you know the hand, Miss Tammy, you know. You want you want to come help? Someone? You're just gonna leave Miss Tammy to do it by herself? That is so messed up. Marcus, this hurts me. This is this is your pilot speaking. You need to. All right. Anyways, all right. We're gonna do this. This is hand gestures, so you can learn how to do it. Wait, I know. Um, I know you know how to do it. Can you come? Or did? Yeah, yeah. You want to come up and help? Just don't leave her by herself. All right. We're gonna learn the hand gestures, and uh, and then you can get a little blood flowing without hurting hips or anything like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I know she won't come though. She's crazy. All right. Ready? Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love seeing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave. From the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. All right, good job. Thank you very much, ladies. That was great. See, that wasn't so bad. I d will say, though, you do have to have enough hair in order to do all that stuff. So that's what, it, that's what it is. Sorry. I'm not able to do it that way. Despairing cry from the 
God of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, billows his will obey. He, your Savior, wants to be me saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love Seated, Pastor. You know, I really should have practiced playing and lifting. That was kind of a <laughs> new thing. Oh, man. He, he was getting you to exercise a bit this morning. <laughs> By the way, I lo- um, <laughs> Lord, I lift your name on high. If you were in youth department in the uh, 90s and early 2000s, that was a standard. So it's not a new song. It's an old song. But some of y'all weren't hanging out with the youth enough to understand that. Uh, Welcome to Sunshine. We are really happy that you're here this morning. Um, Boy, there's a lot going on. I'm trying to get ready to preach because I'm really excited about the message today. Uh, A couple announcements, several announcements. If you're a guest, thank you for being here. And um, we like to bribe you into filling out a card. So if you would fill out a card, we'll give you a coffee cup and a pen. Um, And if you don't fill out a card, we won't hold that against you either. Um, we're just, we just like to have a record of you being here, and uh, um, we don't aggressively come after you and twist arms and things like that. Uh, there was something weird on the back screen. Now there's nothing there. It's, it's okay. Um, let me, <clears throat> if y'all notice, our stage looks a little different. There's a reason. Um, before Larry uh, had, had to go into the hospital and all, there were discussions about spreading people out because everybody was kind of cramped in that one little area. And so in honor of Larry, we went ahead and opened things up. This was his plan and his idea to open things up so we can spread out a little bit and everybody's not all clumped in. And um, uh, just so you understand, next, next uh, Sunday the 18th, uh, will be Larry's uh, memorial service at 3 p.m. Um, we'll have extra chairs in here. It'll also be streamed uh, on Facebook Live. Um, we expect quite a, uh, a crowd. And, uh, um, man, there's people coming, and I know that uh, Zach and Katie are going to be singing. They're going to be part of this. There's, it's going to be a great celebration of, uh, of Larry's life. Now, you guys remember Larry, he, he wasn't real serious all the time, so understand his service is going to be like him. I was actually told, do not wear a suit. So some of y'all that get upset about people not wearing suits, I'm not going to wear one. I was told to wear blue jeans and a Florida State shirt. <laughs> so I will do that, because that's how Larry was up. And for you Gator fans, I'm sorry, just get over it. Um, <laughs> Larry was a Florida State fan. So uh, we will do that. Okay, um, but there, we are scheduling a baptism on February 25th. That we have several people that need to be baptized. And uh, if you're interested in that or want to know more about that, just get in touch with me or, or Pastor Tim. And then our senior crew um, on the 24th of February, we're going to go down to LaBelle to the Swamp Cabbage Festival. And uh, you can sign up the back. You can ride with us in the van. Um, or you can carpool, and uh, they got all sorts of stuff going on. Um, and it's not just eating swamp cabbage, but those of you who are, are uh, brave enough to try it, uh, it's good stuff. Um, my cousin and I were talking about that yesterday, how my dad used to get them and fix them, and we love swamp cabbage at our house. Well, I do, as he won't eat it. <coughs> it's a north, that's a northern thing, not eating it. Um, so anyway, and uh, let's see, next week, um, midweek di- meal is ham, so be sure and sign up for that, and I think that's all the announcements for th- I have for today. Um, like I said, the main thing, Larry's funeral next week, and be 3 o'clock. Plus, we have a missionary next week, Brian and Chris Baggett. Uh, listen, I've known them, they went to school with me, brilliant people, they've been here before, we support them. But they, um, they work with military. They, 
they go to all the military churches around the world, help support the pastors and stuff there. And let me tell you something, that's one of the greatest ministries in there is. If you reach a, a service member, they're already trained on obedience and they understand structure. And if you will, uh, if you, you will find that they will fall right into serving the Lord. And it's a great, great ministry. <laughs> and uh, so please, they'll be here next week. He's a dynamic speaker. You'll, you'll get a blessing out of it. Okay. It's all you. Awesome. Let's go ahead and stand to our feet. We're going to sing uh, this newer song. We've done it a couple times, but uh, At the Cross, Love Ran Red. We're going to learn it. familiar with but this one is the opposite it is super old like 400 years old so we're going to sing be thou my vision and just listen to the words it's a beautiful song Thou my best 
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, Lord, that uh, you are true love, Lord, that you are uh, pure and holy, and that you love us so much that you sent your son to die for us. I pray, Lord, that uh, if anyone doesn't know that, and they would take care of that today, that you would bring the understanding, that you'd bring the conviction. I pray, Lord, that you would help us all to lay our burdens, our sins at your feet, Lord, knowing that you covered our sin, Lord, that you washed us clean. I pray, Lord, that we would be completely surrendered to you today, that anything that you want to tell us about, Lord, that we would have open ears and open hearts to your word. I pray you'd uh, be with Pastor as he brings a message, and that you'd just give us safety, be with those who are sick today. Help them to get rest and heal, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You, uh, you may be seated. Kids, you are dismissed. <coughs> Uh, if you would, am I on? I don't feel on. Um, <laughs> if you would, turn in your Bibles to, <coughs> excuse me, Hebrews chapter 12. <coughs> <coughs> Do you have a cough button? You can, mm, the cough's been getting to me. Um, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 12. It's a really um, familiar passage to a lot of people. Um, I'm going to read it and, uh, and we'll get into this. It says, uh, the Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. This is a great, great chapter, um, and uh, uh, it follows what we call the Hall of Faith. Hebrews 11, and it talks about a great cloud of witnesses, and that's the folks in Hebrews 11, and, and those who have gone on that are witnessing this race we're running. It's like a marathon is what our Christian life is like. Our life of faith, it's, it's like running a marathon. I'm not a great runner. I've never been a long distance runner. In fact, I didn't like to run at all. <laughs> but, but this is what our life is like. There's a great story uh, of a man, um, he was an African man running in the Olympics. His name is John Stephen Akawari. And um, here's the story of him. John Stephen Akawari was a former marathon runner who represented Tanzania in the marathon in the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City. While competing in the marathon in Mexico City, Akawari cramped up due to the high altitude of the city. He had not trained at such an altitude back in his country. At the 30-kilometer point during the 42-kilometer race, there was jockeying for position between some runners, and he was hit. He fell badly, wounding his knee, and dislocated that joint, plus his shoulder hit hard against the pavement. He, however, continued running finishing last among the 17 competitors who completed the race. 79 had started. The winner of the marathon, Memo Waldaldi of Ethiopia, finished in 2 hours, 20 minutes, and 26 seconds. Akawari finished in 3 hours, 25 minutes, 27 seconds. When there were only a few thousand people left in the stadium and the sun had set, a television crew was sent out from the medal ceremony when word was received that there was one more runner about to finish. As he finally crossed the finish line, a cheer came up from the small crowd. When interviewed later and asked why he continued running, he said, my country did not send me 5,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. You know we are in a race. 
Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul uses that uh, uh, expression again about running a race. He says, Know ye that that which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they that do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. You see, we are running a race, and this is a faith race. This is, a, uh, this is something that, that um, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, that's when the, the starting gun fires. And it never ends. It only ends at the, the point when you go home to be with Christ. So there's a couple of questions that we have to look at here. How well are you running now? And how well will you finish? You see, there's a reason for this, this race we run in, and it's a reason for faith. I didn't, wasn't able to get all this into an outline for you, so if you want a first little point, here it is, the reason for faith. Looking unto Jesus, Hebrews 12, 2, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. Jesus is the originator of our faith. He is the preeminent example of our faith. He is the finisher of our faith. He is the one who perfected our faith. It, it, it has a, 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 the idea of carrying through to completion. And Jesus had joy to do so, but that accomplishment cost a lot. Romans 3.22 says this, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. You see, Jesus, the faith that Jesus put has allowed us to be part of. He is the author of that. You see, it, it all comes down to the gospel. That Jesus died on a cross, being fully God, fully man. He despised what he had to do, but he did it. He served us, becoming a replacement for us, taking our sin away. That is where it came from. He did that for us. He is a, and then he sat down, he rose again, and he sat down at the right hand of God. The righteousness that Jesus had, the perfection that Jesus had, when you receive Christ as your Savior, he puts that whole righteousness onto you, onto me. So that when God the Father looks at me, he doesn't see all that crazy stuff I've done all my life. All the bad stuff I've done. All the bad things I think. And the terrible things that I say. Same with you. He sees Jesus' righteousness because it's, big Bible word, imputed. It is put upon you when you believe on Jesus Christ as your Savior. Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, it's not something we can do. It has to come by faith. By faith are you saved through grace. Galatians 2, 16, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Here in Hebrews, the, the writer of Hebrews, I, I kind of think it's Paul. Can I kind of slip with that a little bit earlier? So I'll just go ahead and declare it. I think Paul wrote it. Maybe not. We don't know. But the writer is writing to a group of Hebrew believers or and Hebrews who are maybe about to believe. And they were having trouble understanding how much better Christ is than, than the law. You see, they were, they were programmed, they were taught that they had to keep all the law. Not just the Ten Commandments, but all that ceremonial law stuff too. How many of y'all are reading through your Bible? I'm in Exodus right now. And I've gone through all a bunch of those laws and a bunch of that stuff. That stuff gets kind of wearisome, doesn't it? Lord, what am I going to get out of this today? Be thankful that grace came and you don't have to do all that. That's what I got. 
So they're thinking they have to perform their way and do good works to get to God. By the way, several people, most people today think that. You know, every religion is based on doing something. Even some Christian, um, some Christian religions will, will say, you have to keep this and this and this and this and this. And then you might get to go to heaven. It's always works based. And it can't be because it's Christ righteousness and it's Christ based. Galatians 3.14 that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Galatians 3.22 says, But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. It goes on and says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Again in Galatians, for in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. You see, everything, the reason we have this faith all comes from Jesus Christ. It, it comes from no other place. And when we put our faith into Christ, we are given eternal life. We are forgiven. He is the author of that faith. He is the perfecter of that faith. And we are to keep our eyes upon him. That is what we are to run our race by faith. I love this one. First Peter. By the way, that trial of that faith, it's not always easy, is it? Let's just be honest. It's not easy. First Peter tells us about it. First Peter 1 7 says this. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Peter understood it wasn't going to be easy. We're running a marathon, and we have this faith. And I don't know about you, but I get tired. And you get tired. And this race is long, and it's hard, and there's trials, and there's pitfalls, and there, there's stuff all sorts of stuff. 2 Peter 1.1 1, 1, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have attained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. I want you to understand that everything we do as a believer should be by faith. And Jesus is the one that authored that faith. He's the one that perfects that faith. It's a faith. Grace are you saved by faith, through faith. And we see there's a great cloud of witnesses there. Wherefore, seeing, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, seeing that we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. These witnesses are the deceased people of chapter 11. You know, there's Moses, there's Abraham, there's Enoch, there's all those prophets, there's all these people who lived a life of faith looking forward to Jesus. And then we have now all those people before us who have trusted in Christ and, 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 and are in heaven, and they are a crowd of witnesses who are witnessing us run our, our race. We are to be inspired by those godly examples. The great crowd is not composed of spectators, but rather is made up of ones whose past life of faith encourages others to live that way. Not spectators, but those who have already done it. Paul in Timothy says this, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but to all them that also love his appearing. So let me talk to you a little bit about this race. We need to run this race. How are you doing in this race? How are you doing in running this race? 
the author here of Hebrews gives us some ways that we can be more effective in running the race. And I want to go through these things to you today. And, and, and I, really, I want to en encourage you to think. Um, I was talking to my cousin yesterday and a little bit about this message. And, and I can get really passionate on this. So I'm going to try to keep the passion down and try to say this in love because this is what I'm about to tell you is not an easy thing. It's going to be against a lot of stuff that you think. But it's going to be biblical and true. And if you think through that, you'll find that you're better off. So how do we finish our race strong? How do we do well? The first thing is by laying aside every weight. What does that say? Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Laying aside weight. I know when I was in the Air Force, there was this guy that he ran all the time, and he wore a flak vest so he could make, be stronger, right? In training, I, my wife used to run around with ankle weights, Walking around all the time with ankle weights. You remember that, Laurel? <sighs> um, the only time I want to put weights on me is when I'm scuba diving so I can get to the bottom. <laughs> but we have weights that encumber us. Now, it's great for training, but it's not good for running the race. So let me identify a few um, weights that hurt us. First one, I want you to write this down. The weight of performance-based spirituality. The weight of performance-based spirituality. You may, you may be like, really, let me give that in really simple terms. It's doing all the right things so you can please God. It's performing. It's a, the checklist of I do this, 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 and I don't do this, or this, or this, or this, or this. Or at least I don't let anybody know that I do those things. And I may not do them on the outside, but I'm doing them on the inside. You see, we live in a, a that just weighs us down. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I read this a little bit earlier, but Galatians, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Titus 3.5 says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. We can get fall into that trap of performance-based spirituality. And it leads us to worse places than you can ever imagine. In some areas, it leads us to sin more. Because we get really proud of how good we are how well we're doing. It leads to pride. It doesn't get you justified. Do you realize that Jesus loves you as much now as he ever will? We live in a world where you got to do this, this, and this to make me happy. You have to do this, this, and this. If you really love, you ever fight with your, your, whoever you love, or you say you love, if you love me, you would do this, this, and this. Well, that's not fair, because that doesn't work, because they may love you, but can't do that, that, and that. I, I see that all the time in addiction, where people are dealing with addictions, and, and, and oh, if you love me, you just quit drinking. I said that to my dad. That didn't help him any. That made him worse, because now he couldn't get rid of the drugs. And and, and, listen, that's performance-based. Jesus doesn't love us because we're so good. Did any one of you get saved because you're so good? Did you do Jesus a favor by getting saved? Not me. I'm a mess. I'm broken. 
I was broken. In fact, I didn't get saved until I realized I was really broken. And I really didn't get right with God and become a follower and, 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 a, and a disciple of him until I realized how broken, broken was and how much he loved me. It wasn't performance. Can never be performed. Even now, I, I fail every day. And so do you. I can't, you cannot perform your way into God's love. He loves you besides your performance. Set that aside. By the way, it, it's really much easier to have the same outcome of that, that performance stuff when you're just living out of love for Christ. I do all sorts of things for my wife because I love her. I cook. I go to the grocery store. I'll even go shopping with her. But you know what? She does. We'll, we'll do little bits of shopping, but she likes to really go shopping. And she won't let me do that because she loves me enough that knows that, that I'm, I'm willing to go. I'm going to sit someplace and let her go do her thing. But she loves me enough to not make me do that. That's what you're for. <laughs> I'm going to my wife or my daughter. So we need to lay aside that, that performance-based um, religion, that performance-based trying to get the approval that way. And now I'm going to hit you. Turn to Matthew chapter 23, please. Matthew 23. This is a big one that we need to lay aside. This is a weight that wears us out. Matthew 23, it's the weight of tradition. The weight of tradition. Matthew 23, a lot of times it's called the seven woes because you're going to see that, that Jesus is dealing with the Pharisees and the scribes. And it says, uh, verse 1 says, Then Jesus spake to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works. For they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and they lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers." But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. Let me just stop there and tell you what that is. Phylacteries are these things that hang down and, and they, make, they put stuff around the bottoms of their... It's all about show, man. It's, you know, we had that old term, putting on the Ritz. That's what Pharisees really... They go extra, extra bling. And they love the uppermost rooms at feast, and the chief seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi, teacher, teacher. It's about pride, these traditions that they did. Now the little background is the Pharisees wanted to keep the law. They knew the law of Moses. They understood the law of Moses. And because they wanted to keep the law of Moses, they came up with a whole bunch of rules whole bunch of regulations and those rules and regulations ended up out outshining scripture in their minds so that when the very person they were looking for the christ was standing before them they kept condemning him well you're not you you don't do you don't do this you don't you don't you don't do the way we're supposed to it's those traditions Traditions are not terrible in of themselves until they overshadow Scripture. You're going to say, well, we're Baptists. We don't have traditions. We sure do. Even our order of service, you know, you got to go so many songs here. Uh, it used to be that you do three points in a poem in your message. You know, depends on what the, the past, some, oh, man, yeah. I, I, I used to go to, I don't go to pastor's meetings very often. And I know some really good guys, but I, I went to some way in the past, and 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 it, these guys, man, they kind of strutted around. There was all these guys; they were doctor this, doctor, 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 doctor. Now they didn't earn their doctorate; it was an honorary doctorate. 
if anybody ever gives me an honorary doctorate, <laughs> that ain't going to happen. But if anybody ever did, did that, you would never hear me say, refer me to Dr. Hardy. I'm not Dr. Hardy. I'm not Dr. Dale. No. It, it, you see that, that, that what happens is pride starts swelling. And you start looking around, and we have these traditions, and we, man, even standing up here is more traditional. Now, does it matter? Does it, if I stood down there and gave you the message, or I walked around and gave you the message, would it be different? No. In fact, some of you would, would wake up because I'd be right next to you. You see, we, we, get war, we get worked into these traditions, and we need to lay those aside. Let me go on a little bit in Matthew 23. Verse 15, I have, it says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Man. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you pay tithe of mint and anise and, and cumin and have omitted the weighter matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye have to done and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides which strain at the gnat and swallow a camel. Don't tell me Jesus didn't have, have a sense of humor. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excesses. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside then may be clean also. Man, he just wears them out. Keeps going. Just read the whole chapter, the woes. By the way, I don't know that I'd want Jesus saying woe to me. But we have some of the same problems. We've allowed some of those traditions to override Scripture. I don't care what background you have. If you come from a Roman Catholic background, if you come from the Assembly of God, if you come from a Baptist or an independent Baptist or some other type of Baptist or anything else, there are traditions that are hampering our run because we hold them above what Scripture is. And, and Well, here's another example. Mark chapter 7 says this. Um, Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for, uh, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. There's those traditions. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such things as ye do. And he said unto them, Full well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. We have to be careful. Those traditions can weigh us down. They can keep us from running our race effectively. They can slow us down. They can keep us from being effective for the cause of Christ. Here's what I'm going to get in trouble. The next weight, the weight of education. What? Hear me out. 2 Timothy chapter 3. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, with now, without natural affection, truce bearers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those who are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they that which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Hmm. Second Peter 3 says, According to his divine power hath he given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, 
having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. To virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fail. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent, negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. It's been said that we are educated far beyond our obedience. And can I tell you, that's really true. Let me give you an example. We all know and you will, that, that the Bible tells us that we are going to all the world as witnesses. We're to share our faith everywhere, right? Going to all the world and preach the gospel. That's two believers, right? Come on, nod your head. It's there. Do you want me to take you to it? You want me? Okay. <clears throat> Seventy-eight percent of believers have not shared their faith with anyone. I'm sitting out here. You can ask your own self, when was the last time I shared my faith with somebody? Oh, but pastor, you don't understand. I don't know how to do that. I mean, I don't know enough. Wait a minute. Some of you have been in church 20, 30, some more years. And you're telling me you don't know how to tell somebody how Jesus saved you? I mean... I grew up in a southern family. We are traditionally Baptist. And I knew about Jesus. I knew that he died on a cross. I knew he rose again. Um, but, you know, I knew about him. But I partied and had a great time. And then one day I met Jesus. And I realized that I needed to know, not just know, but I needed to believe in him. And he changed my life. And afterwards, he kept wor keeps working with me. And he, he took me out of a mess. And he, he's made my life have some purpose and, and direction. How hard is it to say, How hard is it just to tell your own story? Oh, but, but we, don't, we need another class. How many of you have sat in class after class after class after class after class, and you never use it? I saw some funny thing on Facebook saying they were, he was... That he was that that some this guy was glad he learned about parallelograms in high school and not how to do his taxes. <laughs> Something useful, right? I don't know. You guys use parallelograms? I, I don't use any of that trig stuff and sine cosine stuff that I learned. Actually, I didn't learn it. I, I had a teacher who he he taped his math lectures and would sit in an overhead. Um, projector and write the form, write the stuff, and he put, he was so boring on those tapes he put himself to sleep. <laughs> and everybody in that class cheated. It was it was awful. But do you realize how much stuff we learn and we never apply? And let me tell you something: if you don't apply the things that you learn, what good is it? You know what it becomes? It becomes trivia. I used to love that game, Trivial Pursuit. Now, I've, I've outgrown that now because, well, too many things have changed. I was proud of myself when, in the early 80s when there was a question about what a Sherman is, and I knew it was a cigar. <laughs> See, you learned something new today. Well, some of you learned something new. I mean, what good is trivial knowledge if you don't apply it unless you're going on Jeopardy or something? You see, we are educated way beyond. And if we don't get some application to that education... It's just a burden. It's just a burden. Only 3 in 10 unchurched Americans, 29%, say a Christian has ever shared with them one-on-one -on -one how to become a Christian. 3 out of 10 unchurched Americans say Christian 
say a Christian has uh, ever shared with them one on one. I'm sorry, I printed that twice. Only slightly more say a Christian has told them about the benefits of participating in a local church. Or 33% said some Christian asked him to come to church would be great. Or the benefits of becoming a Christian, 35%. By the way, when you go and, and, and tell somebody, don't go with the attitude, you go to church and you need to straighten out, you need to go to church. Because you know what's going to happen when you say that to them? They might not do anything. They might stick their finger at you. And then the inside, they're going to walk away. Don't try to straighten somebody out. Did Jesus come in to straighten you out? No, he died on a cross to forgive you of your sins. And when you receive Christ as your Savior, you fall in love with him. And because you love him, you start getting straightened out. And because he gives you the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit empowers you to get straightened out. He didn't come say, I came to this earth to straighten everybody out. You don't see that. He says, I came to die so that you might live. He came to heal the sick, the broken. We need to, we need to, be, we need to be educated. By the way, can I tell you something? Most everybody sitting in this room right now has more knowledge than most of the pastors in the rest of this world. Do you know the difference in American churches and churches in other parts of the world that are, are less advantaged than we are? They're just obedient to what they've heard. Maybe we should start taking what we've learned, putting it into practice and being obedient to it. Because it just doesn't do us any good if we don't. Well, I know all that. Sure, okay, you know it. Was, he, was Jesus peccable or impeccable? I had that question asked to me when I was in Gainesville. Some guy was going to try to be smart. I said, what does it matter? Are you going to heaven? If he was peccable or impeccable, he died on a cross, he rose again. Either way, if you put your trust in him, you'll go to heaven. If not, you're not going to go to heaven. Well, I have all this knowledge. I don't care. Do you have the knowledge of Jesus Christ as your Savior? That what makes a difference. Are you willing to be obedient? Set that aside. Second thing we need to do if we're going to run this race is to lay aside every sin. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which just so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for who, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the, the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. In this context, one of the, the, the uh, commentators looked up said that he was really focusing this thing on sin, the sin of unbelief. That was the first one. The sin of unbelief. They were, these uh, Hebrews were, were kind of refusing to turn away from the Levitical sacrifices uh, to the perfect sacrifice. But you want to know why the, the temple was destroyed? Because, and Jews don't sacrifice today? It's because those sacrifices do nothing anymore. There's been one sacrifice that counted. There's one the Lamb of God who shed his blood for the remission of our sins. His blood paid it all. So they don't need to do that. Now they will do it again in the future. I understand there's going to be a new temple and they're going to start that bloody mess again. But we don't need that because Jesus gave his blood to cover our sin. But there's a sin of unbelief. And you know, even in church today, there's unbelief. There's people here who, man, they're, they're, they're living by tradition. They're living by education. They're living by all these other things. Maybe today you just need to call on Jesus to be your Savior. Maybe you just need to believe. It's not how good you are. It's not, it's not just understand you're broken. You need a Savior, and Jesus is that Savior. And Reach out by faith and tell him, I want you to be my Savior. 
He'll forgive your sins. He'll take it. He'll make you a new person. It'll start on the inside and then show on the outside. That's the sin of unbelief. 1 Corinthians says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. And after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. And after that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. Ephesians 2 says this, For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Romans 10, 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made known unto salvation. That heart, just so you understand, is not the muscle that's beating here. It is the inner person. It is the, the, the seat of intelligence. It is the, the soul, so far as it affected and stirred both good and bad. It's the soul as the seat of sensibilities, affections, emotions, desires, appetite. It's who we are. The soul or mind, the fountain and the seed of thoughts, passions, desires. That's what that heart is. You have to believe with your heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Not here, but here. It's not just those sins of unbelief. By the way, if you're here and you're not a believer, right now, just right now, you can say this in your heart to yourself, to God, Jesus, please be my Savior. Please save me. He'll do that. But there are some other sins you need to lay around. Now, some of y'all are pretty good about picking out the sins, right? Oh, man, I don't drink. What's that what Pastor Bells you say? Um, I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't chew or goes with the girls that do. I don't know that. I, I used to see some girls that would dip snuff and I'm not going to kiss them. We are good at naming the big sins, but do you know there are some other sins? We call, there's a whole book about this, one day I'm going to have to teach this. It's called Respectable Sins. Do you realize that most of you are committing these respectable sins all the time? Let me run through a list of these. Ungodliness, that means we don't act like God, though we're supposed to. Unthankfulness, we gripe about everything, don't we? That's the other thing about Exodus from reading. Man, those Israelites, they sure did gripe about everything. Oh, wait a minute. So do we. You want to see a lot of gripes? Read the, the, the restaurant reviews on Facebook of local restaurants. Here's a big one in our world today. Anxiety. We worry ourselves to death. Why should we worry? Look, I'm, I, now let me tell you, I've, I break all these too. But anxiety, is, we're actually proud about our anxiety. You hear it all the time. Frustration. Oh, that's, that's one of my big ones. Discontentment. Oh, I suffer that one too. I want it. I want it better, bigger, better, stronger. Jump higher. PF flyers, you know. How about this one? Pride. Selfishness. Impatience. Oh, here's another one I hit. Irritability. Is that something that happens as you get older? Or have I always been irritable? <laughs> Anger. Judgmentalism. Sins of the tongue. A lack of self-control. Envy. Jealousy. 
Do you realize that we all suffer from that? Do you realize that we're all broken because of that? And that's why Jesus had to die? Do we have to continue to live in that? No. We don't. We have to confess those sins. Because he is faithful and just to forgive those sins. And to cleanse us from those sins. And make us righteous. Let's lay aside the weights, the sin, and we must, to close out, focus on Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Just quickly, focus on Jesus' character. Maybe you need to be reading the, the uh, Gospels. Look at what Jesus did. Look at the people he hung out with. You know, he, he really had trouble with all the religious crowd. I'm not so sure that he wouldn't have trouble with us. But he had a real problem with them. So he went to tax collectors and prostitutes and sinful people, and they responded to his message because they understood that they were broke and they needed what he had. The religious people didn't think they were broke. They were prideful. Focus on his character, who he, who he was, who he is, how he loved, how he cared, the things he cared about. You know, he loved kids. And the disciples said, oh, don't let those kids come. No, no. He says, <laughs> I'll never I, I gave Miss Sandy one time a picture of a millstone from Israel. <laughs> because sometimes it gets really discouraging working in that nursery. We don't want to keep the kids from coming to Jesus. It says we're better off if you, if you offend one of those little ones. It's better off if you have one of those millstones put around your neck and thrown into the water. By the way, millstones are big. Focus on his character, who he is. Focus on his ministry. And focus on his promises. Listen, we have a long race to run. If we're going to be successful in that race. If we're going to enjoy that race. If we're going to, to, to <clears throat> get through the pitfalls and the challenges of that race. We need to lay aside those sins, lay aside those weights, and keep our eyes focused on Jesus Christ. If we're going to thrive as a church, if you're going to thrive as a believer, we need to put aside those things and be like Jesus. It's the one little thing for me, little confession. I was, uh, some of y'all remember Mike Williams. Do you remember him? He was the comedian that came and talked to us about Cups Missions. Funny guy, right? I was with him on Thursday. I took a whole bunch of cloth and a bunch of sewing machines, and man, they were so thankful and looking at the ministry that he works with in um, Lakeland. And uh, he told me, he goes, I was, I pastored for three years, and I was a terrible pastor. And I said, well, why were you such a terrible pastor? He says, I taught them the Bible. I said, well, what's wrong with that? He says, I didn't teach them to apply the Bible. I didn't take them out and show them what to do. Some of you all wonder why we have so many different venues to get out. It's to give you an opportunity to take what you've learned and put it in practice. So I want to be, I want to ask your forgiveness because I may not have taken you with me to go do that. I want to help you find a way, help you use your gifts. Many of you took spiritual gift tests. You took them home, you took them. I, I had to ask somebody what theirs was. I'd like to know what your gift was, what came out as your gift, so how you can use that gift and use it for, for God's glory and to help you run this race. I need to help you thrive as a believer. We have plenty of opportunities, and there's always more opportunities. You're going to hear a whole lot about those coming in the, in the next weeks through our missions and, and different things. But I want to ask your forgiveness because I've not... Oh, uh, we do a pretty good job of educating you, but we need to help you apply that education. And I, I ask your forgiveness for that. I've talked to the Lord, but I'm asking your forgiveness. And I'll help you. I'll be happy to help you 
use your gifts, use the things you've learned in running your race to be a blessing to others. Let's stand and we're going to pray. Father, as we come this morning, Lord, there's such a great cloud of witnesses. They have been an example and an encouragement as we run this race that you've set before us. We thank you for Jesus, the one who died for us, despising that shame on the cross, taking all of our sin upon him, and then having victory and rising. And then when our faith starts, when we put our faith in him, our sins are forgiven, and we run this race for you. Help us to lay aside the, the weights. Help us to lay aside the sin and focus on Jesus as we run this race. And may we finish well, glorifying you all the way. In Christ's name, amen. We're going to sing a um, hymn of invitation. Listen, I, I don't know what God's dealing with you in your heart, but answer that. I don't want to be up here and try to sell you and get you to come down and make this. I want you just to be obedient to God. Whatever he's laid on your heart, whether it's salvation, whether it's being involved in something, whatever it is, please be obedient to him. You can come. We'll pray with you if you want to do that. If you want to fill out a card and drop it in a, uh, uh, in a bucket, at the, the offering bucket in the back, we can do that. It, it, whatever, whatever, just be obedient to God and deal with him now as he deals with you. so much um, rough message I understand but uh, I was preaching to me today Amen. Um, hey y'all have a great day uh, don't forget Wednesday night services be praying for a good news club this week and JYC those are ministries into elementary school and uh, middle school um, I'm going to be meeting with some people on Wednesday uh, for with fellowship of Christian athletes about some opportunities um, uh, with them and around them and, uh, and then be in prayer for uh, um, the service next week. Um, my part is to give the gospel. That is what is to do. And, um, but it'll be a, it will be a very uplifting service. Uh, please be in prayer for the family. Hey, and be here for it. It'll be great. Amen. All right. Um, Tim, dismiss us. All right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for today. I thank you, Lord, uh, that you do love us enough to uh, convict us of our sin, Lord, that you don't want to leave us in our sin, that you want us to 
uh, grow and share our faith with others, that you um, love everyone so much you want them to hear about your grace, your mercy, and how we can know you through faith, Lord. I pray that you would help us to do that, that you would help us to ignore any fears that, that Satan brings, but realize it's just simply telling others what you have done in our lives. I pray you'd give us those opportunities and help us to recognize those opportunities we get every day to be a testimony for you. I pray that you'd go with us and keep us safe this week. In Jesus' name, amen.